was only 16 and in high school at the time of this story. It was just a regular day at school. I had finished my lunch and I was heading back to class when suddenly the intercom came to life. Attention, all students and staff, the principal's voice echoed through the cafeteria. We are now on lockdown. This is not a drill. Please remain in your classrooms until further notice. I felt a chill run down my spine as the chatter in the cafeteria turned into silence. Lockdowns weren't common at our school and I couldn't help but feel a sense of despair that was gnawing from the inside of me. I quickly gathered my thanks and I followed the students as we were being directed to hide in the gymnasium and in the school locker rooms. I checked my phone hoping for some news or updates, but the signal was weak and I couldn't get any information. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed through the hallway, followed by screaming. My heart raced as I realized that the danger was closer than I had thought it was. I could hear the sound of heavy footsteps approaching from down the hall. My classmates and I huddled and we moved faster together, trying to remain as quiet as possible. We had no idea what was coming our way. The seconds ticked by slowly and we all tried to snugly fit together. It was so packed that it took like five minutes before I made the split decision. It was taking too long for all of us to fit through the gym and into the locker room as there was just so many of us. I decided to run through one of the open doors in the gym that led outside where the gym teacher was. I'm not sure what he was doing, but he didn't even try to chase me. I ran to the back of the school and through the soccer field, and I hid near the woods. I whipped my phone out and I attempted to call my mom, when suddenly I turned around after hearing, What are you doing? It was a familiar face. Tanner. I knew who he was, but not very well. He had been in some of my classes all through the school years growing up, and he was just staring at me with his menacing eyes and brandishing a weapon. My breath caught in my throat as I looked at him in horror. I couldn't even speak for a second. He had a handgun holstered to his hip and an M4-styled rifle equipped in his hands, and he was pointing it at me. Hey man, don't do this, I said, pleading for help. I could feel the adrenaline coursing through my veins as he debated on blowing my head off. I stood up and faced him, in the heat of the moment practically thinking this might be the end, and my heart pounding in my chest. To my surprise, I saw a flicker of hesitation in his eyes. I knew I had to try and reason with him, to make him see that there was another way. Man, you have to stop what you're doing, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. This doesn't have to end like this. Please think about what you are doing. To my relief, he actually lowered his weapon after about five minutes of pleading with him. And he weirdly broke down and started crying. I could see the desperation and pain in his eyes as he revealed he wanted the pain to end. Without warning, Tanner turned and left me alone, leaving me in a state of perpetual shock. I knew I had to do something though. I couldn't just sit there and wait for the worst to happen. I made a split second decision again and I decided to leave the school grounds completely. I could see the playground in the distance, so I ran towards it, hoping to find somewhere I felt more safe. I crouched behind a fence by the swings, trying to catch my breath, and while I figured out what to do next, I suddenly heard footsteps approaching and I knew I had to act fast. Peeking out from my hiding spot, I saw Robert. Oh man, it was nice to see him because he was one of my best friends at the time, and he said he saw me run out of the school when I did and he ended up following me. He said he saw the whole thing where Tanner had me held at gunpoint and he said he almost lost me trying to find me here. Tanner didn't go on to hurt anyone that day, unlike he planned. And surprisingly, he willingly let the officers arrest him. It's crazy how I had barely escaped a terrible outcome. I ran home as fast as I could and told my mom everything while she hugged me and we cried. Tanner was a kid who had been bullied his whole life. That obviously doesn't give him the right to kill people, but man, something in our world needs to change. In 2017, in my last semester of high school, some friends and I decided to skip the pep rally for the girls' varsity basketball team, making the playoffs for the first time. My last period of the day was theater tech. I was just taking it as a fine arts credit, and two friends of mine in the grade below me were in that class with me. We decided to skip the pep rally, leave school early, and go to the nearby Taco Bell like we did every day. However, administrators and security guards patrolled the parking lots to catch kids trying to skip. 
so we took a detour through the nature trail on campus in order to avoid them. Once in the nature trail, we came across this kid I hadn't seen before. He was a skinny white kid with shaggy black hair, wearing baggy jeans and a plain white t-shirt. He was shorter than me, but the most notable thing about him was his general look of dishevelment. His hair was wild and full of leaves and twigs, and his plain white t-shirt was dirty and the knees of his jeans were stained green and brown. He looked like he had been crawling around in the trail. I remember wondering if he lived there for a split second. When we came up upon him, we were walking in one direction, parallel to the school and to the back of the parking lot, and he was coming directly toward us. I knew the nature trail well enough to know that there was a bend that led deep into the woods, and I figured he had come from there. He was out of breath and he seemed scared. Weird. My two friends said hi to him, because my friends were in the grade below me and later told me that the kid was in their grade and were just acquaintances with my two friends. It was supposed to be just a quick hello, but I couldn't help but notice how scared he looked and how suspicious he seemed of us. He asked us what we were doing in the woods and we told him we were skipping the pep rally. One of my friends asked, what have you been doing out here? Camping? Me and my other friend gave a nervous laugh, but the kid didn't crack a smile. He explained that he was dropped off at school that morning and was supposed to get on a bus to take him to DAEP, which is the alternative school that kids who got suspended from school went to. His plain outfit started to make sense now. It was the infamous uniform of the alternative school. He then explained that he didn't want to go to the alternative school, so when his mom dropped him off, he pretended like he would wait for the bus and then hide in the trail for the full eight hours of the school day. He was still acting really skittish though and, without even looking at each other or speaking to each other, my friends and I could feel that something wasn't right with him and that we were in some kind of danger. The kid looked around nervously often as if seeing if someone might have followed us or if we were alone in the woods. Not long after this, we hit him with a, alright man, well good luck. We're going to try to get to our cars and go home before the pep rally ends. When he heard the word cars, he perked up. He started walking with us towards the parking lot, continuing to talk. He becomes a lot more friendly and asks if we can give him a ride home. We give him some half-baked excuse as why we couldn't do that. You know, we didn't expect him to ask that because I never met him and my friends barely knew him. But he really wasn't taking no for an answer. He tells us that people were going to start looking for him pretty soon, that he was going to be in a lot of trouble. We told him that he'd probably be fine hiding there in the woods, but he tells us, nah man, you don't understand. I broke into a car at the fellowship. He then pointed in the direction of the mega church that had a parking lot that backed up to my school. I took this. From his waistband, he pulled out a handgun and I felt sick to my stomach. I had never seen a gun in real life before. At this point, I felt in danger, not just because he pulled a gun. I had never really been scared of them, more so that the entire interaction felt uneasy and that the guy was already unsettling and desperate. One of my friends very cautiously tells him that he should probably just ditch it and take off somewhere. He just stood there, staring at us for an uncomfortable amount of time. His eyes were meeting each of ours. I broke the silence by saying that we wouldn't tell anyone but that we really had to go before the pep rally ended. And my other stupid ass friend, who had been virtually silent the entire time, spoke up and said, yeah, and it's best we're not around if they start looking for you for that, gesturing to the handgun. His eyes narrowed and once more he asked if one of us could take him home. This time it felt more like a command. I've never been a super brave person, but in that moment, I don't know why I just blurted out, nah man, I'm good. Again, there was an uncomfortable silence. Then he asked, Before you leave, do you guys want to see something? My first friend was kind of a hothead, and although he was uncomfortable with the situation, I don't think he was afraid of conflict. Nor was I, but my other friend, however, was not a fan of conflict and would always de-escalate first. We all looked at each other, and me and my first friend kind of had an unspoken understanding like, This is going to happen. If we have to run or fight, we might have to do it now. My other friend was very visibly afraid. He asked, what do you want to show us? And before the kid could answer, my first friend said, we don't want to see. 
we have to go. My first friend started briskly walking past the kid, and me and the other friend quickly followed. Within a few steps, we just started sprinting towards the parking lot. I looked back once we were about 50 steps away, and he was still standing there watching us run. He had put the gun back in his waistband before taking a small adjacent trail back deeper into the woods. By the time we made it to the parking lot, there were police everywhere. We were sweating, out of breath, and terrified. They found the kid in the next 10 minutes or so. Somehow in the chaos, nobody saw us exit the nature trail and into the parking lot. But since there were so many cops in the parking lot, we decided to just head back inside through another side door to find that the door was locked. That's when an administrator had found us, brought us inside, and shoved us into a classroom where we were able to talk with others and find out exactly what was going on. This is what we could piece together from what we learned. Turns out that the kid had skipped DAEP, like he said, hid in the nature trail, broke into a car at the church, and stole a semi-automatic shotgun and a handgun from the car. After stealing the guns, he texted his girlfriend and he told her that he was about to do something really terrible and that when she saw his name on the news, she should turn off the TV. He told her explicitly how he was going to hurt some kids at the school. She knew he was supposed to be in class and was so worried about the text that she contacted the police. The school was put on lockdown until officers got a call from a guy at the church that two guns had been stolen from his car behind the school. And that's when they put two and two together and caught him hiding in the woods. I guess when he saw me and my two friends in the nature trail, he quickly hid the shotgun but didn't have time to hide the pistol. Or maybe he didn't care enough to hide it. So I guess it's been about nine years or so now, which seems pretty unbelievable to me. It's such a vivid memory that it almost seems fresh, but I think that may also be because I've repeated it so many times by now that I pretty much have an entire monologue memorized, recounting exactly what I experienced. Seems pretty weird to say it, but I was definitely lucky in some way. Luckier than most. I knew some kids that saw a lot more of what happened that day than I did. In my opinion, I've pretty much moved on from the shooting, and I haven't really suffered from any long-term emotional scars, but... A few of those guys ended up pretty screwed up from it all. I know one girl who was super outgoing and smart before the shooting. She ended up dropping out of school our junior year because of a heroin problem. Or that's the rumor at least. A few years ago, my sister found out that she had overdosed after she got out of rehab, leaving her two small kids with only their elderly grandparents left to raise them. Unfortunately, a seemingly large part of my former classmates have also struggled with severe emotional problems and depression, which definitely resulted from that day. Anyways, I guess I'll start this off like I always do. I remember it being one of the last few weeks of freshman year. It was cloudy, as it often is during the springtime in Oregon. What I remember thinking that was initially odd about that day is that it seemed much too warm for the sun to be hidden behind such a thick layer of clouds. It was hot, sticky, humid, and overall extremely uncomfortable. The high temperatures had forced almost all the students and teachers to the courtyard during passing time, 10 minutes between classes, in order to achieve some temporary relief from the stuffy, non-air-conditioned classrooms that we were stuck in all morning. I have two sisters. One is a year younger and still in middle school at the time. My older sister was a sophomore, but happened to be home with a stomach flu that entire week. Thank God. It was a Friday, and I remember everyone was really looking forward to our long Memorial Day weekend. My parents were supposed to take my sisters and I out for a weekend at a nearby resort in town, which is a popular thing to do among our community. I spent the entire time before school making plans with friends and chatting about the various 15-year-old shenanigans we would partake in. To say that our weekend plans had changed would be an understatement. I had P.E. first period that quarter, and we spent the time playing flag football out on the stadium turf behind the school. Since I had a free second, I volunteered to take the equipment back to the supply closet in the upstairs gym, while everyone else went to the locker rooms to get ready for their next classes. We had two gyms and locker rooms on the west side of the school, and a large enclosed courtyard separating them from the other classrooms and administration office. I had finished putting the cones, pennies, and whatnot in their place and headed downstairs to the locker room, deciding to leave the supply closet open for the next gym period, which has turned out to be the single best decision I have ever made in my entire life. 
I had nearly gotten to the bottom of the stairs when I heard a loud pop, pop, pop. I stopped dead in my tracks as my mind tried to process the noise I just heard. My confusion turned to horror as I heard the screams and saw everyone left on the west side of campus sprinting down the hallways and through the closest door they could find and slamming them shut. I turned running back upstairs as fast as I could and heard five more gunshots by the time I got back to the closet and I shut the door behind me. All I could do was sit in the corner and bury my head in my knees sobbing. I heard three more scattered gunshots, then nothing. Nothing for what felt like an eternity. I can't even begin to describe how slow time was passing. I had absolutely no sense of time because my cell phone was still downstairs in the locker room. And there was no way in hell I was leaving the safe blackness of the supply closet. The worst part about hiding in the closet was not being able to talk to my mom and let her know I was okay. I just sat there and cried, praying and thanking any god who would listen to me that my sister was safe at home. I would have driven myself insane with worry if I was stuck alone in that closet and not knowing whether or not my sister was okay. I sat and waited, waited for what felt like either was going to be my safety or my death. It seemed like hours before I heard the footsteps. There's no way to describe the feeling of being alone in total darkness, overwhelmed with this amount of fear. All of a sudden, I didn't feel like I was completely alone. I heard two sets of footsteps running up the stairs and into the gym, and then nothing. Until I was startled to near death as one final pop radiated through the gym rafters. My ears rang as I attempted to accept my impending death, and the fetal position on the floor as footsteps headed slowly toward the closet door. I watched the strip of light under the door as a shadow of two feet blocked the light, and I was overcome with terror. I heard the doorknob shake aggressively and I began to sob, thinking of losing the chance to see my family again, that my fate was stuck in the hands of an angry psychopath on a shooting spree, looking for the opportunity to execute me as I crouched helplessly in a dark and lonely closet. Before I knew it, the doorknob had been broken off. The next few moments are the most vague in my memory as a member of the SWAT team pulled me to my feet and ran with me by his side. It was so fast my feet barely felt the ground. He kept my head down, but that didn't hide everything. I saw so much blood under my feet on the pathways as the officer rushed me through my school courtyard and murder scene. I didn't know him, but I heard of him from my sister. He was a junior at the time and a very depressed and bitter boy. I guess he had few friends, if any, and always seemed to have a temper. She witnessed him one time throw desks and sometimes would have huge temper tantrums in the class when he didn't understand the material. From what I have been told, this is more or less what went down. As I was finishing up in the supply closet, there was an altercation in the courtyard involving the gunman. He had words with another student and pulled out his gun, shooting the other kid three times before opening fire on the crowd as chaos ensued following the first round. After fatally shooting both the student and a language arts teacher, he ran into the west wing of the school and hid underneath the bleachers in the downstairs gym for a while. After a while, his cover was blown, and he ran upstairs to the gym where I was followed by an officer, and then was shot and pronounced dead, which I didn't see, thank God. It was a pretty terrifying experience, and I suffered from a lot of anxiety for a while after this, but I've lived a pretty successful life since then. One thing I've taken away is that no matter where I am, I always make a point to eye the nearest escape and plan of action, just in case.